Oh, Fox, Fox left out so much here that really upsets me. This is so important. <laughs> So we're going to look into the history of the Israeli Palestinian conflict. We're going to watch a Vox video. I have a feeling the Vox video is going to lean very, very anti-Israel. And it's probably there's probably going to be some misconceptions in there. We'll see. So I'll fact check them and we'll give that a watch. One of the biggest myths about the Israel-Palestine conflict is that it's been going on for centuries, all about ancient religious hatreds. In fact, while religion is involved, conflict's mostly about two groups of people who claim the same land. So just right there, I agree with them. I mean, the conflict has not been going on for centuries. It largely starts at the at the end of the 19th century with the beginning of the influx of European Jewish immigrants to the area of Palestine. There'd always been Jews living in Palestine, but there was a huge influx of, uh, of immigration because of Zionism and anti-Semitism in Europe. And that's really when the conflict starts, because uh, I don't know if you know this, but people tend to not like immigrants. People tend not to not like refugees and a lot of refugees coming all at once. I know lefties normally love that, though for some reason they make an exception when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But that's when the, the conflict really begins. But that doesn't mean that the seeds of the conflict weren't there beforehand. Um, so in a way, like the area of Palestine has always had a lot of problems for thousands of years, um, as I've talked about. So I think that that's why people say it goes on for thousands of years. Um, it's really just kind of like a language thing. But where I really agree with Vox here is that it's not the core of the issue is not religious. Like religion adds fuel to the fire. That's how I'll describe it. But the fire will exist with or without religion. It's very much about ethnic groups like claiming the same land. It's a geopolitical land issue. You take religion out of the picture, and I guarantee you it will still be a problem. Maybe not as intense of a problem, but it will still be an issue. And it really only goes back about a century to the early 1900s. Around then, the region along the eastern Mediterranean we now call Israel-Palestine, then under Ottoman... No, Zionism actually would totally exist without Judaism. A lot of people have a misunderstanding. So Judaism is the religion of the Jewish people. But the Jewish people exist without that religion. And I think that that is one of the larger misconceptions. I think people have this idea, and it's probably a Christian idea or a Muslim idea, right? Because Christianity and Islam applies, is, uh, they're purely religions. Anyone can become that. They're not based on some kind of ancestry or anything like that. Whereas um, being Jewish is much more like being Romani or being a part or being indigenous, right? Like a part of an indigenous tribe. It's like you tra can trace your lineage to a tribe, right? You were kicked out of your indigenous homeland. And, the, and some people have the religion, some people don't. A lot of people still have aspects of the culture. Um, but that kind of thing, it's, it's just, it's a very, very different dynamic. It's a, that's why it's called an ethno-religious group and not just a religious group. So that's why Zionism would exist without Judaism. Because even if all Jews were atheists, right, it doesn't actually affect their historical connection, right, to the region. The same way if a bunch of indigenous Canadians, like from, say, like um, the Mohawk tribe, suddenly stopped believing in their Mohawk religion, I'm not sure about the details of what they believe in, they wouldn't suddenly stop claiming Canada as, you know, their home, um, because that's still their historical home. So it's not really as much about religion as you think. There's also a lot of religious reasons why you wouldn't support Jewish religion reasons why you wouldn't support the creation of a modern um, Israeli state um, as initially Zionism was pushing for. Um, it actually broke a lot of Torah rules initially, and rabbis did a lot of negotiations to make that happen, to make that okay later. But the kind of being Jewish that Israel recognizes today as being religiously Jewish, um, so even if Zionism would have, it's Judaism is still a big part of it. Oh yeah, Judaism is still a part of it, right? But it's not like the core. And Jewish people were very, particularly Zionists, were very, very non-religious. Um, if they were, they might not necessarily have been, some of them were atheists, some of them were um, deists, but very few of them believed in the, like, Jewish religion of God's chosen people or, like, God's chosen land. Um, that was not really a core part of Zionism. And that was actually, it was much more co-opted by the religious right later on. Now it is a huge thing, Right. And it wasn't originally. Rule for centuries, 
was religiously diverse, including mostly Muslims and Christians, also a small number of Jews who lived generally in peace. It was changing in two important ways. First, more people in the region were developing a sense of being not just ethnic Arabs, but Palestinians, a distinct national identity. So there is this narrative, and Vox is kind of pushing this, which I see as somewhat problematic, that, I don't know, would you consider black people living in apartheid South Africa living in peace? It's like the one of the biggest problems is that Jews in Palestine were always second-class citizens, and I mean that in a literal way. Um, they were things in in the Ottoman Empire system, they were called demis. They were regularly subjected to massacres and genocides and discrimination. They had to pay extra taxes. Like the reason why like it often gets a better reputation was because it's better than what was going on in medieval Europe, right? And it was better than what was going on in 19th century Europe, but it was still very, very bad, right? So this idea that they were living fine and relative peace, that's why they add the term relative, right? Um, because what you consider peace is a little, you know, and it's a bit of a misconception. Identity. At the same time, not so far away in Europe, more Jews were joining a movement called Zionism, which said that Judaism was not just a religion, but a nationality, one that deserved a nation of its own. Yeah, and I want to repeat, this is totally true. Um, in the 19th century, nationalism was a huge, huge movement. It was a trend. Right? Like the way we see trends right now where like, I don't know, there's a trend this year where people are saying eat the rich on their dresses or something. There was a trend of nationalism. And even though today in 2021, we see nationalism as this right wing concept. In reality, in the 19th century, nationalism was seen as a progressive leftist kind of concept because nationalism and wait for it, Twitter is going to be really upset. But nationalism in that context was actually antithetical to what was going on at the time, which was imperialism. Nationalism was a way to end imperialism, to end colonialism. Oh, I mean nationalism in general, right? There was Arab nationalism, there was Asian nationalism, there was lots of different forms of nationalism. African nationalism comes a little later, but there was a huge trend of nationalism in general. Everyone wants their own state. Everyone wants their own state for their people. Um, this idea, there had been an old idea of like this, these empires overreaching, controlling everything and everyone being in control of those empires. And finally, a lot of those individual groups were like, no, we want our own self-determination. Now we see this as a right-wing point of view because we've seen the consequence of people having their own self-determination based on ethnic groups. Caused a lot of problems. <laughs> But at the time, it was seen as a very lefty th thing to get out of what was considered a larger evil, which was imperialism. So nationalism is a huge trend, and Jews are not unique in this trend. Everyone's trying to get, like, um, Arabs in Palestine are trying to get their own nationalism because they are also under the control of the Turks in the Ottoman Empire. So this is a larger trend in general. It's not just a Jewish thing. And after centuries of persecution, Many believed a Jewish state was their only way of safety and saw their historic homeland in the Middle East as their best hope for establishing it. In the first- This is very, very, I, I'm glad that uh, Vosh said historic, right? People often think that this is based on Jews having a religious connection, right? That this is, that they wanted to go to Israel because it was their religious right. Very few Jews at the time believed that. A lot believe that now. But at the time, very few believed that at the time, right? Like it was very much based on a historical right, on a historical homeland, the same way Mohawks would be connected to the area of Southern Ontario. This is based in history. We know that Jews come from that region. This is a historical fact. It's not something that some God invented. It's not something that some Bible invented. In fact, there's a lot of things that the Bible actually is wrong about. For example, the Bible describes the Jews as this new people that come and defeat the Canaanites to take over the area of Palestine, or it's called Canaan at the time, right? In reality, what most historians and archaeologists heavily suspect is that the Jews were the Canaanites, and they were just kind of like a burgeoning population within the Canaanites as they became monotheistic. Fascinating stuff. If you're religious and Jewish, it's probably really upsetting to hear. But that's the current attitude within it, right? So there is a long historical connection of 
you know, the Jewish people as a tribe, not a religion, to the region. In the first decades of the 20th century, tens of thousands of European Jews moved there. After World War I, the Ottoman Empire collapsed, and British and French empires carved up the Middle East, the British taking control of a region it called the British Mandate for Palestine. At first, the British allowed Jewish immigration. Exactly. So the Mandate of Palestine really doesn't last for a very long time. In regards to control over the region, it's actually probably the shortest empire. The, the Ottoman Empire controlled it for much longer. The Roman Empire controlled it for much longer. The Byzantine Empire controlled it for much longer. So it's actually one of the minor points, but it's very important because it directly leads to um, the creation of the modern Israeli state. But as more Jews arrived, settling into farming communities, tension between Jews and Arabs grew. Both sides committed acts of violence, and by the 1930s, the British began limiting Jewish immigration. And that is true. There were actually huge massacres. Um, there was a Hebron massacre, right, where there's actually regions in Israel where there are no Jews. And I know this is crazy, right, but because tons of Jews were actually just literally massacred in those regions. Um, Hebron is one of them. There were also massacres done to Palestinians, right? I shouldn't use the term Palestinian because in reality, Jews are Palestinians at the time as well, right? So actually, I'll just start saying Arabs. Um, to, and, and it was done to Arab Muslim. So there are just regular conflicts. And so Vox is being honest here when they say that there's a lot. You'd probably have to really calculate it mathematically on who did it more, but it's kind of like nickel and diming. In response, Jewish militias formed to fight both the local Arabs and to resist British rule. Then came the Holocaust, leading many more Jews to flee Europe for British Palestine. Okay, they kind of skipped over this, but what starts to happen is... Remember I told you guys that nationalism is a huge aspect? So in 1919, after World War I, when like they cut up the Middle East um, and divided between empires, this was a normal thing that had been done over the past 100 years during European colonialism. They have wars, right? And they divide it up. And this is how you see like these arbitrary lines in like Iraq and et cetera, right? You know, like, oh, the French get this section and this get, and they don't really care about where it's useful to have these borders. But... 1919 is a little different because now there's this huge new nationalism movement that's really becoming strong. And both Arabs in the region want their own state and Jews want their own state as well. For some reason, Christian Arabs were not vying for their own state. And I don't really like know about the details of why, so I can't say one way or the other. However, they're kind of like competing, but they also have a larger enemy, right? And the enemy is the British. So Jewish Palestinians see the British as evil imperialists that have taken their historical homeland and Arabs see the British as the exact same thing. You could see here if like, I'll show you guys some really interesting stuff. So this is just a poster from the time for the freedom of Palestine. It was the original Free Palestine. Um, Jews of America organized. <laughs> Register as a member of the Zionistic, Zionist organization of Canada. So you can see how they call it Free Palestine because it's all about, you know, and you see there's a guy on here on a horse with a Jewish star on his head. And it's all about like kind of this grassroots movement to basically kick out these evil imperialist British. Like the British were the real big enemy at the time from a Jewish Palestinian perspective. Um, when I say Jewish Palestinian, I literally mean like Jew like Jewish, right? Like I'm, that what would eventually become an Israeli. This is another example, um, help free Palestine. They see like the, the hand that's really strong, like making that fist, but it's in his shackles. And you've got to help them financially because they need money to get weapons and to build settlements and all these things to try to defeat the British and free Palestine and create a modern Jewish state, which would become Israel. Really interesting how the term free Palestine changes over time um, to mean something totally different. And galvanizing much of the world in support of a Jewish state. In 1947, as sectarian violence between Jews and Arabs there grew, the United Nations approved a plan to divide British Palestine into two separate states. They skipped so many important things like the Balfour Declaration and so many false promises. So there's tons and tons of conflicts going on, right? Like there's actually Jewish terrorist groups 
called the Stern Gang that starts at the time. And when I say terrorists, I literally mean terrorists. And they start targeting the British specifically. So they blow, they infamously blow up the King David Hotel and they're trying to do much more, like they disagree with the Haganah, which is the more kind of mainstream organization that's trying to negotiate much more with the British to create a Jewish state. Um, they disagree with their technique. They want to be much more harsh. They're more fundamentalist to kind of kick out what they see as their oppressors, the British. So they start, you know, bombing them, etc. You know, rings a bell, I know. One of the other things that was going on also is that uh, the British are making promises and conflicting promises to both um, the Arab Muslims of the region and the Jews. So they're telling the Jews, specifically the head of the Haganah, who is David Ben-Gurion, he would later become the Prime Minister of Israel. I'll show you guys see. So he's doing a lot of negotiations with the British, and the British are regularly making um, promises where they'll say like, okay, we'll give you this part of the region, we'll give you the entire west part of Palestine, we'll give you the entire east part. And keep in mind, the British mandate of Palestine did not just include modern day Israel, it also included Jordan. Keep in mind the concept of Jordan did not exist at the time. So their, the mandate really includes the entire area. This is their entire control. But yeah, so they're making conflicting promises and this in the end makes the situation far worse and it directly leads to the um, Arab Muslims rejecting the creation of an Israeli state. I mean, hindsight is twenty twenty. But for all, because the core of it, like, one of the big moments is when, like, is in May 1948, the UN declares Israel a state. The next day, immediately, all the Arab nations surrounding Israel, including the Arab Muslims in the region, declare war. And they don't recognize it. And what's unfortunate is if you look at those 1948 borders, they're actually very good for Palestinians. Like, far better than they would ever get now. So they should have accepted this deal. Right? But hindsight's 2020. Like, they actually got the most fertile regions. They got like the oldest regions, probably the higher quality regions. But they didn't accept it. And the reason why they didn't accept it, and this is a narrative that's often being sold, a Zionist narrative that I'll say. The Zionist narrative is that they didn't accept it because they hate Jews and they didn't want um, Jews to live in the region at all. And they just wanted um, Palestine from the river to the sea. But in reality, they didn't accept it because they had been made false promises, right? False commitments. There were treaties, treaties that were signed, and this is very similar to how indigenous Canadians were treated by the British. They were given lots of false treaties and they were told that they were actually going to own much more land. So they reject it, not as much against Jews, but against the British, if that makes sense. So yeah, blame the British. Jews are also being given conflicting promises, but they eventually get at least somewhat of what they wanted. They don't get Jerusalem, but they still get, you know, some areas to call themselves a state. One for Jews, Israel, and one for Arabs, Palestine. The city of Jerusalem, where Jews, Muslims, and Christians all have holy sites, was to become a special international zone. The plan was meant to give Jews a state, to establish Palestinian independence. I still think that would have been the best solution, um, considering, but it's not possible now. I can't even imagine it happening now because there's now been like, you know, 70 years of buildings and um, infrastructure around the Israeli state um, in Jerusalem as their capital, that like, it's very hard for me to imagine that ever becoming an international zone. And it's unfortunate because originally the plan was a good one. And to end the sectarian violence that the British could no longer control. But the Jews accepted the plan and they declared independence as Israel. But Arabs throughout the region saw the UN. So the blue area is what's considered Jewish Palestine. The green area is what's considered Arab Palestine. Arab Palestine doesn't get created because they reject the deal. Jewish Palestine does get created and gets renamed into Israel. The UN plan is just more European colonialism trying to steal their land. Many of the Arab states, who had just recently won independence themselves... That's actually true. I forgot to mention that. There's also the other element of them seeing a lot of Jews, right? And this is incorrect, but seeing a lot of Jews as European imperialists just of a different type. Now, this is a misconception, and it's something that a lot of Twitter and stuff still believe, which I think it's crazy because it erases tons of history of Jewish history, but, you know, Twitter doesn't know a lot about Jewish history. But 
they kind of, they're focused so much. There's this concept at the time of creating like pan-Arabism and this like, and Arabs finally getting independence from their overlords, whether, because a lot, the, the Ottoman Empire were not Arabs, right? They were Turks, technically from Europe. A lot of people don't realize that. So they, so they're free from them and then they're free from the British. They're free from the French. They're free from all these other powers. Um, and wanting to create and wanting to rule themselves in the entire region of the Middle East. And the problem is, is that Arabs, while being the majority in the Middle East, are not the only indigenous population there. And of course, what you consider indigenous is totally subjective, right? Um, because originally Arabs came from Sa Saudi Arabia. Obviously, that's where the name comes from. There's a lot of debate going on there. But I, th I really think like once a group lives there for a few hundred years, I'm just, I think it's fair to call them someone indigenous. Selves declared war on Israel in an effort to establish a unified Arab Palestine where all of British Palestine had been. Actually, now I think about it, I think I changed my mind on that. Obviously. The new state of Israel won the war, but in the process, they pushed well past their borders, borders under the UN plan, the taking the western half of yeah. Jerusalem and much of the land that was to have been part of Palestine. They also expelled huge numbers of Palestinians from their homes, creating a massive refugee population whose descendants today number about 7 million. At the end so, some of this is true, some of this is not. Let me just repeat this just so I the western half of Jerusalem sure and that. much of the land that was to have been part of Palestine. They also expelled huge numbers of Palestinians from their homes, creating a massive refugee population whose descendants today number about 7 million. Okay, so this was the original allocation of land. Remember, the Arabs rejected it. Okay, and they start a war. The war starts, Israel wins the war. They should not have won the war. Okay, in fact, most people would have bet against that. There's a lot of reasons why they ended up winning it. Um, the primary reason is because of the arms help from Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union. Because the Soviet Union at the time was hoping for Israel to become communist because they were there very lefty. So Israel ends up winning. It's kind of, it's a fascinating, I love 1948. I mean, I shouldn't say it because in a way there were so many awful things that happened in the year. But I find it a fascinating war. First of all, it's a very long, it's a long war for such a small region. And on top of that, I know, surprise win for the USSR. But it's really ironic, of course, because the USSR ends up becoming an ally of Egypt against Israel later on. Um, which is one of the reasons why Israel allies with the United States. You know, fun fact, right? They weren't original good allies. So Israel ends up winning that war. And that war was... There were so many awful things that happened in that war, and there is still a core, a result of that war is that there's tons of refugees. So there are lots of Jewish refugees, but because Israel wins the, uh, the war, the Jewish refugees just move to other re regions within Israel. Especially Israel wins so much territory. You can see how much territory they win. They win territory near Gaza over here. Um, they win territory in the Northeast. Um, they went territory really close to Jerusalem, but not directly, right? And guess who else wins territory? And this is where Vox is being somewhat dishonest, because Israel was not the only winner of the 1948 war, because there was another country that was created originally um, by the British. Look what's going on here. It's Jordan. So Jordan ends up winning basically all of this territory. So this area is the West Bank. They win the West Bank. They win Jerusalem. And it's never, it's never Lebanon, yeah. Um, never try it yet. Don't get, like, all these Middle Eastern countries are very different from one another. So Jordan actually wins a lot of this territory. And this is why, like, this Vox thing, and when you see a lot of these maps, you, you know when you see, like, those maps of, like, where they show you the this, this shrinking region of, of Palestine, and then they show Israel? They're very dishonest maps because they always show what's seen, what's like the shrinking area as being Palestinian when a lot of the times it's Jordan taking over that region. And it's very strange that they lie about that, right? Um, and I don't understand like why they get away with doing this on it. But people love those infographics, right? Because it makes it seem all simple. Palestinians from their homes, creating a massive refugee population. But yeah, it's true. We actually don't know. It's a huge debate between historians right now on what the cause of these. So there were 700,000 refugees that were create, uh, Palestinian Arab re refugees that were created out of this war. Historians to this day 
do not agree on what caused those refugees. So Vox saying that implying that there's like some 100% fact um, implies that there's a historical consensus. And I think that's a little dishonest. I mean, it's not a little dishonest. It's very dishonest. There is no historical consensus. And I have my opinion. And my opinion actually lends, agrees with Vox. I agree in terms of the research that I've done and the research that I've seen other, you know, in terms of the amount of um, historical, like, scholarly work that's being done. I think it's much more likely, right, that, that I would say largely Palestinian refugees were kicked out by Israeli forces. However, there is no historical consensus from that. It's considered a controversial opinion like not just from Israeli historians, actually, it's a lot of a lot of Israeli historians are the ones that find this research, but just largely in all of Israeli Palestinian, like in the entire like academic sphere. But yeah, so I really wish that they had just said that, right? That like, originally, it was thought that Palestinians were had left um, because of radio broadcasts, and there were radio broad broadcasts, but there's a lot of new historical information saying it's much more likely this way. I wish they would have said that, right? Instead of just acting like it's a fact, because we don't know for sure. It's just like things that, you know, that we're arguing based on likelihoods and statistics and, um, and various numbers. I've actually done a stream where I went detail for detail over each village and what happened in each village, talking about what crimes happen in those villages, you know, and whether or not those villages end up becoming refugees. And you have to get that down to the details, like the actual numbers to release this kind of stuff. At the end of the day, we have no records that we have no records from Israel, from the Israeli government, even though they've released so-called released all their documents to historians, um, that there was any intention to kick out or ethnically cleanse the area. However, there are little tidbits and signs um, in the 19. I think it was in early 1930s or late 1920s. David Ben Gurion had brought up the idea of ethnically cleansing Palestine, and I think that that is like our one connection and what makes me think it was somewhat intentional. But otherwise, we don't have as many records to prove it. Um, we also have a lot of records that say the opposite, right? Um, and this is where hist the historical method really comes into play to debate, like, you know, which, you know, which record, like which prime, which source is going to be more accurate. So, for example, we know that there were Arab broadcasts from the neighboring Arab countries literally telling Arabs to leave regions. So it's very hard to know, like, like, was it just that they were told to leave or were they pushed out to leave? And or was this an intentional thing by the new Israeli government to scare them out of it? Right. Like, it's very hard to know. I lean towards it. And the key and the reason why that this is such a big issue is because it leads to legal issues associated with the concept of a refugee status with the right of return. I don't think is Palestinians can ever get the right of return. Because as Vox mentioned, there's over, over six, over seven million. Those 700,000 have now become seven million in terms of their descendants. I don't think that that's ever, there's no room. They can't come there and Israel still remain a majority state. So the only solution to me is if you think that Israel is the cause of the refugee problem, are financial reparation. And Israel does not actually have as much money as a lot of people think. So I, I think that that's the real financial rep reparations are the, the solution. But I think Israel would probably say, oh, well, what about all the Jews financial reparations for all the regions that they were kicked out of in the last 100 years? And that's part of the problem. But anyways, so just wanted to mention that Vox didn't population didn't whose descendants today number about 7 million. At the end of the war, Israel controlled all of the territory except for Gaza, which Egypt controlled, and the West Bank, named because it's west of the Jordan River, which Jordan controlled. This was the beginning of the decades-long oh, Arab-Israeli conflict. Oof. During this period, many Jews in Arab majority- But you see, like, I don't like that they just called Jordan and they labeled it as green, right? Like, implying it's the same thing as Palestine. It's kind of weird. Majority countries fled or were expelled, arriving in Israel. Then something happened that transformed the conflict. Yeah, so and the, what happens is basically in places like Morocco, Egypt, as a consequence of Zionism, tons and tons of Jews get kicked out of, and there were a lot of Jews, right? We have this image of mostly Jews being white-looking Europeans um, in the United States. But in reality, a lot of Jews 
are not white looking at all. They come from very, you know, they a lot of them have a very you know, darkish skin, skin tones. A lot of them look very much like Arabs or um, there's also black Jews. There's Asian Jews. There's a lot of different and they mostly get kicked out of a lot of their regions, particularly the, the Muslim countries at this time. Um, and so there's what we call um, in geopolitics, a population exchange and um, population exchanges are not good. Uh, they cause a lot of human rights issues. Um, but the problem is, is that once you do a population exchange, it's very hard to reverse the change because you basically just recreate the problem even worse when you try to reverse it. And this is one of the problems with the Palestinians having the right to return because they want to take up space. They want to, you know, come return and they're a much larger population now. When in reality, what's happened is tons, there was a sh like, there was an exchange of tons of Jews who were expelled from other Arab nations replace them. So you would almost have to kick some of them out to have Palestinians at return and have there be enough space and, um, and be able to support everyone. And obviously that's not viable. In 1967, Israel and the neighboring Arab states fought another war. When it ended, Israel had seen... It's so interesting what they decide to skip. They skipped the 1956 Suez Canal crisis, which I find fascinating because it's a very big moment of when Israel starts developing a relationship with the West. Um, they initially develop it with the British Empire. Well, it's not really the British Empire anymore, but it, it's interesting that they don't start talking about that because there is like this misconception that Israel's always that like America created Israel and uh, America is the only reason why Israel existed. And it's it couldn't be farther from the truth. This was like a slow relationship that developed over time as Israel started cozying up closer to the West rather than the East during the Cold War, um, when originally they were probably closer with the East. Why do we accept this desire to maintain the ethnic majority? I don't like I think it's. I, I think in general, it's a toxic concept. The problem is, is that it's almost like a, a required toxic concept in, if you look at the realities of the dynamics of the Middle East and the rest of the world, the truth is the majority of the world operate in somewhat ethno states, particularly the Middle East operates in a somewhat ethno state, religious state situation. So like the situation that we have in the United States and the West is actually a very unique one where like this idea of a country being not having a religious or ethnic basis. It's very, it's actually very unique and I like it, right? But you can't just somehow implant that, right? In a region where no other countries have that operation, right? Um, it has to be something that develops slowly over time. Like for example, if you look at most Middle Eastern countries, right? Um, here, let me look, let me show you guys. Before we look, when you see most Middle Eastern country flags, they're all going to have three, around three colors, right? Where they're all going to be mostly red, white, and green and black. Sorry, it's four colors. And a lot of them are going to have a Muslim symbol on them, which is like kind of like a moon. I forget the exact term. So you can see that the majority are those colors. And that's not a coincidence. It's not a co because everyone just likes those colors. Those are what are called the pan-Arab colors. So all of these, the pan-Arab colors is about establishing an ethno state, and it's about Arabs being able to rule themselves. So it sounds like it's free from imperialism and there's a good side of that, but the consequences, it's somewhat of an ethno state, right? A lot of these uh, countries also have Islamic symbols on them as well because they're also a religious state. So because of the context of the region, right, that like everyone's, that all these states are religious, all these states are like, you know, our ethnicity base and national base. Um, it makes sense considering that Jews need a safe area around the world and they can't just rely on the United States. It makes sense that they would have their own, at least for now. I always say that it, the way to regard it much more is more of like a safe space. And the reason why you don't want to, it's not the same thing as something like white nationalism. Um, or like a white ethno state is because like a white ethno state like relies on this concept that whites are being genocided, right? Like that there's a white genocide that like whites are being run. And in reality, it's so the opposite. So I, I should say it's the opposite anymore, right? But we'd all love to get to a area where, you know, ethnicity, religion and all that stuff matters very little. But to me, it's kind of crazy to expect a people to be like, well, you guys have to accept everyone and then watch that majority population turn it into an Arab pan state where Jews become second-class citizens. 
think, okay, like you guys should just have to deal with that, right? You could just have to take the hit so you have the morale, like the moral headway. It makes sense in a world where there are tons of ethnic and national and religious states, right? Do you at least have one for your own where you're safe, at least for just one country? And I think that that's totally valid. The Golan Heights from Syria, the West Bank from Jordan, in both Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula. Yeah, and that's also accepting, like, I don't actually think Israel is an ethno state for Jews. Israel accepts it gives equal rights to all people who are not Jewish. Israel also, people can convert to Judaism, right? It's not just, you know, race based or ethnicity com based completely. The only really right that Jews have over Israel, like, there's obviously some, is like, they have the right of return. Um, and that's because the nation, the, the purpose of the creation of Israel is to protect Jews. Yeah. Um, to protect endangered people. Yeah, like the issue with a white ethno state, right, is because it's based on a lie. And that's like the problem. Israel was now occupying the Palestinian territories, including all of Jerusalem and its holy sites. This left Israel responsible for governing the Palestinians. But yeah, that's why I wouldn't call. So, okay. So this area, this blue area right here. Oh my God, I'm using my finger to point. This blue area right here, that is what's called the Sinai. It's mostly desert, like no one lives there. So you might be like, oh, like if, if it's mostly desert and no one lives there, like why is it so important, right? Because it's really like for Egypt, if you look at where Egypt is, like this is Africa. So Egypt is in the northeastern part, right on the edge of Africa. And their one connection to the Middle East, okay, is Israel. And Egypt's at the time at war with Israel officially, right? Like they're enemies. They're not enemies anymore. So this area of the Sinai is very, very important to also, I shouldn't have said no one lives there. There's some Bedouins who live there, right? Like there, it's just, it's very low population, but this area of the Sinai, okay, is very important, okay, for defensive purposes. And there's a lot of, and this is a common theme that you'll see in this region where like, there's a lot of areas where like no one wants to live. It's not useful, right? But it's only useful for like a defensive or military purpose. And as you can imagine, especially against an Israeli air force or something, it's very important for Egypt to own this land. And for Israel, they like owning the land too, right? For the exact same reasons. A people that had fought for decades. In 1978... So when Palestinians talk about... Pal uh, when, so when people talk about Palestinians being second-class citizens, they're not referring to how things are within the borders of... Yeah, they're not talking about within the borders of, of Israel, right? Because there's two populations. Sometimes they are, right? And they're... But, and that's somewhat dishonest, right? There is discrimination, but I wouldn't call them second class citizens, right? There's what I would call like systemic racism, the same that you would see against black people in the United States. But would you call it them second class citizens? No, because they have all the same rights, but there's systemic issues that need to be dealt with, right? There's still discrimination, all of that stuff. It definitely, there's, it's definitely not great being any kind of minority in Israel. The same, but it's not a particularly, I wouldn't even compare what an Arab Israeli deals with to what a Palestinian who is a descendant of one of those refugees, right? That's the differing population. Um, I would not even compare it to what they're experiencing and that's what they, they get called Palestinians. Now, where people get really confused is a lot of people who advocate, who are anti-Israel advocates, they will often use terminology, the term, the term Palestinian to describe all Arabs within the region of Israel as well. This is not legally correct. So it's very dishonest and I don't like it when people do this. People do it for a political purpose. Um, they do it because they don't believe in Israel's right to exist. So they believe that all Arab Israelis sh are Palestinian. And a lot of Arab Israelis believe, regard themselves as Palestinian. They have every right to identify the way they want, right? But it's very dishonest when you're t teaching and talking to people about the issue. Because you need to turn, use the legal terms because they're different groups and they have different legal recognizations, right? An Arab Israeli votes in Arab elections, right? You know, can go become Miss Israel, uh, leads companies, right? And can go across any border they want. They have an Israeli passport. They vote. Um, they can run in the Israeli government. They can become lawyers. Like um, they have the same license plates. They can sit and go to the same restaurants and sit in the same bars and like they have all the same basic right. Whereas a Palestinian, and so this is why I call them Arab Israelis, whereas a Palestinian, which is an Arab that is a descendant of the 700,000 refugees from 1948, they live primarily in Gaza and the West Bank or they're refugees in other places like Jordan and around the world. I'm sure you've met, I've met a bunch. Or Andrew, East Jerusalem, I should mention. Whereas with them, they have checkpoints, 
They're regularly discrim like they they have checkpoints everywhere they go. They don't have any passports. They're stuck there. They can't leave. They can't fly anywhere. Um, they're subjected to terrible living conditions. They're the ones that I'm told I, I regularly talk about when it comes to Israel's policy of uh, collective punishment when you destroy a building. They're the people that like they're they're the few areas they do have to live are constantly being taken and their settlements being built in them. They're having their homes stolen. Like there's a lot of you can't compare those two groups of people. It's almost insulting to Palestinians, right? To act like they're somehow in the same lane. The only reason why people group them together is because they have a political end of trying to wipe Israel off the map. And if Israel's wiped off the map, then they all become one population or they're against the creation of Israel itself. And so they say it, they group them together because they say they're all Palestinians. But it's dishonest, right? Even if you politically agree with that, I just wish people would be like, I wish they would be one population, but they're not, right? Because there's just, it's like, there's such different privileges. It's not comparable. And this is one of the issues where like, especially when you're looking at whether or not Israel's an apartheid state. And I think, I just, I don't think Israel's an apartheid state. Um, because I don't include um, Palestinians as a part of that state, right? However, I think Israel's on its way to becoming an apartheid state if it continues on the path it's going. That's my opinion there. Anyways, we'll Israel continue. and Egypt signed the U.S. broke David Accords shortly after. They sometimes do leave, like, because if you get into, like, there are areas that you can leave. Um, like, a lot of Palestinians do, do get out, um, but it's a challenge. After that, Israel gave Sinai back to Egypt as part of the peace treaty. At the time, this was hugely controversial in the Arab world. Egyptian President Anwar Sadat was assassinated in part because of outrage against it. But it marked the beginning of the end of the wider Arab-Israeli conflict. Yeah, so originally, we call this conflict now the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. This is actually newish terminology. It originally was called the Arab-Israeli conflict. And my expertise is much more on the Arab-Israeli conflict, right? And how that affected Palestinians. And it's funny because a lot of people come to me now asking me about my opinion on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but I'm not as educated on that, right? I have a lot of context of the history of it, and I'm, maybe I'm a little more educated than the average person, but I still wouldn't even consider myself anything close to an authority, right, I'll, like on the subject. This is why you should always fact check me, you should always research, because, yeah, there's so much extras that add to it. But originally, Israel was at war with all those surrounding Arab countries. And you can imagine that they were a much bigger problem for Israel than a small refugee, a, a refugee population, which are the Palestinians. But that problem largely gets solved. Not completely. There are some countries that are still officially at war with Israel, like Syria. Um, Syria is right at the top. You can see Syria northeast. So they share the Golan Heights with, uh, with Israel. And they are still officially at war with Israel um, to this day. A lot of people don't know that. But it, it's only really when the Arab states start making peace with Israel, Jordan does it, Egypt does it, that it starts becoming an Israeli-Palestinian conflict, particularly because the Palestinians, who initially were hoping for kind of like a pan-Arab state of all, like, you know, controlling the entire region, now they're like, we're kind of getting abandoned by our brothers. And this is when Palestinian national... What's the word I'm looking for? But nationalism, like Palestinian nationalism, really begins. And led particularly by Yasser Arafat, um, who was the leader of the Fatah party. Um, this is also when you start seeing Palestinian terrorism. It begins mostly in the 1970s, um, part, like with Black September and the um, Munich Massacre. So, and this is when you start seeing the from the river for, to the sea. And this is really when the Israeli-Palestinian conflict starts becoming a thing. Um, because they feel very abandoned by neighboring Arab countries. You'd think Egypt would be the last country to recognize Israel after the Suez crisis. I know, it's kind of crazy, right? But Anwar Sadat was an amazing, amazing person. Um, I encourage you to look him up. The people that have made moves in the history of this conflict towards peace are extraordinary. If you want to feel shit about yourself as a person, read about some of these people. Anwar Sadat's one of them, where uh, his wife, too, is extraordinary woman right and about what he went through to make peace and what's so sad is there is a long tradition in this conflict of peacemakers being punished peacemakers being killed even jimmy carter 
right? Jimmy Carter famously creates, creates that handshake between Anwar Sadat of Egypt and Israel. What happens? Like he loses his election. I think he's a one-term president, right? Is he a one-term president? And no, Jimmy Carter was a killer. But he's regarded, he has a very bad reputation. He did not get like a Reagan-like reputation. And he was very much like economically, emotionally, like kill, uh, sorry, uh, publicly, like um, treated very terribly. Um, Anwar Sadat is killed. There is Israeli prime ministers who move for peace are killed. Ariel Sharon, who literally had committed war crimes in his past in Lebanon, he later, his, when he makes moves for peace, he gets completely destroyed in Israeli elections. He's not literally killed, but he dies soon afterwards anyways due to health issues. And he's regarded very badly in history. It's like one of those really sad facts of like the people who have made moves for, for peace did fucked up shit. Um, and it feels really nasty. Over the next few decades, the other Arab states gradually made peace with Israel. Yeah, and then even if they Isaac never Rabin, signed formal peace also, treaties. Yeah, he was assassinated but it, for making moves for peace as well um, by uh, a right-wing Israeli. Israel's military was still occupying the Palestinian territories of the West Bank and Gaza. And this is when the conflict became an... And keep in mind, a lot of people think that they're occupying it from the Palestinians. And in some ways that's true. But the people who had been occupying it before were from Jordan. So they were like basically reoccupying it from Jordan. Jordan had originally occupied it because originally the area of Transjordan was almost indistinguishable from Palestine. All this entire area was basically considered the original biblical Palestine under like Roman. So it's, it's like they were basically indistinguishable and the cultures were very, very similar. So Palestinians thought that if Jordan took over, that they would be treated well. And they weren't. They were subjected to terrible massacres. Um, you can, the reason the Palestinian terrorist group that starts in the 70s, Black September, it's actually named after a Jordan massacre of Palestinians, um, not an Israeli one. So Jordan does not treat Palestinians well. And, they're, and it's one of those really, really sad things that Palestinians are regularly abandoned by people they saw as friends, um, by people that they thought cared about them. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of them are very angry. And I think that they deserve to be. An Israeli-Palestinian struggle. The Palestinian Liberation Organization, which had formed in the 1960s to seek a Palestinian state, fought against Israel, including through acts of terrorism. Initially, the PLO claimed all of what had been British Palestine, meaning it wanted to end the state of Israel entirely. Fighting between Israel. This is true, and this is when um, the PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization, is the precursor to Fatah. Fatah is the more standard, accepted, it's the alternate version of Hamas um, in terms of the Palestinian government. So Fatah is more accepted by the UN. They don't subscribe to violent methods anymore, right? Like they do all the things you're supposed to do. The problem is they're also really corrupt. They have a nasty history of corruption and they're con largely considered ineffective in peace deals, um, which is one of the reasons why Palestinians are very frustrated with Fatah right now and are voting for Hamas. But originally Fatah was the PLO and the PLO were the kind of original Hamas. They were the ones doing the original terrorist attacks. Um, uh, and by terrorist attacks, I know, I mean some like, some nasty stuff, right? Like stuff that's indefensible to me, even though I understand why they're angry, right? Like killing a bunch of um, innocent Israeli uh, um, athletes and murdering them in cold blood is fucked up. They would um, hijack planes, lots of stuff like that. So the PLO has a very negative history from a lot of Israelis' perspective. And this actually contributes to Fatah being seen in a very negative way by Israelis now. Um, because they see, because they see Fatah as the same thing as the PLO, because they come from the same organization, and they still remember what happened, because it wasn't that long ago. Like, the PLO was still supporting and launching terror t terrorist attacks into the 2000s. Um, it's only a recent thing in the last 20 years that they really stopped. And there's a lot of debate whether or not they stopped, but I think they mostly have. Important thing is that Hamas is much worse. So, pick your enemies. <laughs> Israel and the PLO went on for years even including a 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon to kick the group out of the stillness of the cease. Israel starts does an invasion of Lebanon. Now, I'm not that knowledgeable on the details of this war, but there are massacres that happen um, during this war by Israel, particularly like infamously by Ariel Sharon. Um, and it creates a long history of, and this happens again, 
during another Lebanese war with Israel, where Israel feels like the Lebanon is protecting Palestinian terrorists um, and creating their own terrorists with Hezbollah. So lots of issues Fire there. In southern Hezbollah is a separate Lebanon organization. Lebanon was shattered today by the sound of guns, bombs, and planes. Now, the PLO later said it would accept dividing the land between Israel and Palestine, but the conflict continued. As all of this was happening, something dramatic was changing in the Israel-occupied Palestinian territories. Israelis were moving in. These people are called settlers, and they made their homes in the West Bank and Gaza, whether Palestinians wanted them or not. Some moved for religious reasons, some because they want to claim the land for Israel, some just because housing is cheap, often subsidized by the Israeli government. The latter is actually the most common. So people often really, really hate settlers, and I'm against settlements, and I hate the settlements, but I don't hate settlers. The reason why I don't hate settlers um, is because they were incentivized. A lot of them were, some of them are there for political or religious reasons, right? And for them, I have very little sympathy. But the majority of them are actually there for economic reasons. Israel is a very expensive place to live. The majority of people who leave Israel do not leave Israel because of the um, material, but because of the conflict or because of war or danger, they leave Israel because of economic issues. It's very expensive to live in Israel. And the Israelis here will tell you, it is a hard life in Israel in terms of, and I'm not comparing it to what Palestinians experience, right? Because that's a whole other separate issue. One of the major reasons why my family left, two reasons my mom didn't, my parents didn't want me to live in war, but a big reason was economic. It's a hard place um, to live, um, especially when compared to other Western countries. Um, it's very expensive and there's very little space. Um, the idea of like a three bedroom house, you don't get that shit in Israel. You do not get a three bedroom house in Israel. That is something that is only allowed for the rich, the very, very rich. In Israel, the most you will get is a shitty apartment. Everyone lives in shitty apartments. Okay. Um, so the only place you're going to get a house, if you want a house and you want your kids to be able to have green space and be able to run, um, is in the settlements. And that's like, and that's the problem. So a lot of people buy there because it's like, it's good value for your money. Um, and it's often the only place they can afford to live, um, because it's cheap and it's not just cheap because Israel literally subsidizes it. Um, it's cheap because people don't want to live there, so it's cheap, right? Because it's dangerous. It's dangerous living what's called over the green line. Um, people regularly get murdered there, they get stabbed there. People, when you have a car in the and you live in the settlements, um, you're in a, a bulletproof car. The buses are bulletproof, okay? I've been there once when I was a kid. It's scary. It's legit scary. Um, because you're basically almost entering like no man's land and you're supposed to, and people live there and have homes. So it's cheap because of that. That's why it's cheap. And one of the reasons is because Israel's just constantly like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons why Israel struggles economically compared to other Western nations. Now people see them as very strong because they are strong in comparison with Palestinians and other Middle Eastern countries. But I'm just comparing them to other Western right now. Okay, anyways. Some settlements are cities with thousands of people. Others are small communities deep into the West Bank. If you've always felt a deep yearning for Jerusalem, now is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity not only to stand within its gates, but also to build the home of your dreams there. Settlers are followed by soldiers to guard them, and the growing settlements force Palestinians off of their land and divide communities. Short term, they make the occupation much more painful for Palestinians. The settlements are the biggest issue. Honestly, out of every single thing, the discrimination against Palestinians, the checkpoints, um, the water issues, like the, honestly, even the military occupation, the worst thing are the settlements because of how permanent settlements are, right? And you can't kick out settlements. You have, you can, but it's really bad when that happens, right? Because then you're basically ethnically cleansing a region. And that's what happened in, uh, in Gaza. When Israel pulled out of Gaza, lefties all loved Israel pulling out of Gaza, right? And I do think it was the right thing morally to do. But the consequence of pulling out of Gaza and giving it back to the Palestinians was ethnically cleansing the, the region of Jews from Gaza. They literally kicked out all the Jews. So a lot of settlers, especially settlers that are there for political purposes, know this, right? Which is why they keep building settlements. And this is why Netanyahu supported more settlements, because they know every, every settlement that makes it harder and harder to pull out of the region, because it makes it more of a human rights disaster when you do pull out.
And this is why I get really scared that Israel is going to become an apartheid state. And all those lefties are going to turn out to be right when they criticize Israel, calling it apartheid. Because if they keep building the settlement and more and more settlements happen, it's going to be a more and larger and larger of a human rights disaster to pull out and to um, get rid of the Jews from the region and give them back to the Palestinians. So it means that the only solution you're going to have is a one state solution where everything becomes an Israeli state. The big problem with that is that for Israel to continue to exist as Israel and not just, you know, become a non-Jewish state. And that's just a typical Arab country in the Middle East with an Arab majority population, Israel and to remain with Western values and all those things, um, Jews need to remain the majority of the population. So if they're not the majority of the population anymore, right, because you're now including the entire region and, and tons of and Palestinians are coming back, what happens to all the citizens, all the people that are now in Israel, all the Palestinians that are now considered in legal Israel, because you probably don't trust them to give them normal rights and everything, um, because, I mean, you're literally just at war with them. So what are you going to do? You're going to make them second class citizens. And voila, you start having an apartheid state. So I think it's very likely to become that. And that really concerns me. And I think every single time there's another settlement, it's more and more likely. And that really makes me sad. Long term, by dividing up Palestinian land, they make it much more difficult for the Palestinians to ever have an independent state. Today, there are several hundred thousand settlers in occupied territory, even though the international community considers them illegal. By the late 1980s, Palestinian frustration exploded into the Intifada, which is the Arabic word for uprising. So Palestinians have a positive term with the concept of Intifada. To most Jews and Israelis, the word Intifada means killing Jews, right? Because they saw the uprising, because the uprising specifically targeted not Israeli military buildings or uh, political buildings, but they targeted civilians. And there was a lot of anti-Semitism connected to it. It began with mostly protests and boycotts, but soon became violent. Israel responded with heavy force. A couple hundred Israelis, over a thousand Palestinians died in the first Intifada. And this is the sad thing, is that the Intifada the Intifada is remembered so fondly by Palestinians to this day. There's a first Intifada in the 1980s and then a second Intifada, which begins in 2001. Those, both of those Intifadas are remembered so positively, when in reality, it was actually the majority of Palestinians that end up dying as a consequence of it, not Israelis. A lot of Israelis died, a lot. Specifically in the second Intifada, like over 2,000 um, Israelis ended up dying. Almost every Israeli knows someone who lost someone in the second Intifada. I lost someone, but more Palestinians lost people and both. And that's like the weird thing. There is like, and this is something that frustrates me about Palestinian nationalism um, and advocacy groups, right? And not all are like this, but a lot of the protest movements, especially that you see on like Twitter and at student groups and stuff, they almost fetishize these violent insurrections in the Intifada. There is like, they show pictures, the, they paint paintings and murals of a Palestinian holding a rock and throwing it. Um, it's like there's a fetishization of Palestinian violence as a way to overcome their oppression. And it like the real people like it hurts Israelis, obviously, but the people it hurts the most are Palestinians because it gives Israel um, its excuse that it needs to kill, you know, to get involved. And it only causes more and more problems for Palestinians. And it did. Palestinians had much more rights before that. So they actually haven't like it didn't even help their case um the wall only gets built the wall ruins so many palestinian lives and it only gets built as a consequence of the second intifada so if you care about palestinians and you want them to live in peace and prosperity and have their own self-determination you should not support palestinian violence particularly terrorist violence right you should not support that okay because it has the opposite effect all it does is it feeds into the right wing in israel's like hands um, to start pushing for their larger Israeli state and to take over the entire region and subject the Palestinians as second-class citizens. Around the same time, a group of Palestinians in Gaza who considered the PLO too secular, too compromise-minded, created Hamas, a violent extremist group dedicated to Israel's destruction. By the early 1990s... Okay, who did they say created Hamas? ...too compromise-minded, created Hamas... Around the same time, a group of Palestinians in Gaza considered the PLO too secular, too compromise-minded, created Hamas, 
a violent extremist group. And keep in mind, the PLO is very violent at the time. So Hamas was not more violent than the PLO. Okay? The, the main difference between Hamas is that, um, and the PLO is that Hamas is being funded by Iran. Okay? So it's actually a c controlled by foreign interests. Very important difference. And the PLO has its own problems, trust me. But Hamas is being controlled and funded by Iran. And it was partly supported initially by Israel as a kind of... People think Israel created Hamas. It didn't really create it, but it did, um, it did support its creation, right? It did like, it was happy about it being created initially. I'm sure they regret it now because uh, of, you know, it's like when you have an enemy and the enemy are the Palestinians and you're happy that they're divided. So they thought, oh, let them fight amongst themselves. Dedicated to Israel's destruction. By the early 1990s, it's clear that Israelis and Palestinians have to make peace. The leaders from both sides signed the Oslo Accords. Oslo Accords are so important, and people act like they're not important, and it drives me up the fucking wall, man. Like, the Oslo Accords are the most important year in um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Maybe, okay, the second most important year after 1948. And I encourage you to go read the Oslo Accords. If anyone thinks that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is unsolvable, that it can't ever be fixed, go read the Oslo Accords. It's an extraordinary, extraordinary meeting. And this is one of the reasons why even all the fucking shit Bill Clinton has done, I, this is a big fucking check mark for me. They lay out city by city, like situation by situation, okay, rules and regulations on how we are going to solve this. It's the first time. This is when the concept of a two-state solution gets created. This is when Palestinians finally stop relying on other Muslim neighboring of Muslim countries to help them, and they realize that they can get their own nation. This is when Israel starts finally being able to see that there is an end to, that there is an ability to finally have peace. A solution is laid out of how they can get there. It's very important. This is when the creation of the two-state solution. I encourage you to go read it. When I'm talking to someone and they argue to me that they don't, that like, especially when I'm talking to people that are either anti-Israel or pro-Israel or whatever, and they're telling me that they don't believe in a two-state solution, and I ask, have you read the Oslo Accords? They never have. Ever. Go read the primary document. It's good. It's not a dry read. Okay, maybe a little, <laughs> depending. The Oslo Accords are really, really important. And like, this is why diplom and it's one of those beautiful moments of diplomacy. And holy shit, I don't know, 93 is like, I don't know. It's like the one silver lining in this conflict that just seems sad and sad and sad. And you literally get them to agree to these dynamics. This is meant to be the big first step toward Israel maybe someday withdrawing from the Palestinian territories and allowing an independent Palestine. The Oslo Accords established the Palestinian Authority, allowing Palestinians a little bit of freedom to govern themselves in certain areas. Hardliners on both sides opposed the Oslo Accords. Members of Hamas launched suicide bombings to try to sabotage the process. Yep. The Israeli right protest peace talks with ralliers calling Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin a traitor and a Nazi. Not long after Rabin signs the second round of Oslo Accords, a far-right Israeli shoots him to death in Tel Aviv. That's very sad. But this violence showed how extremists on both sides can use violence to derail peace keep a permanent conflict going as they seek the other side's total destruction. That's a dynamic that's been around ever since. Negotiation. I totally agree with them here, and I appreciate that Vox is being honest about that. There are so many forces at play. Even if you suddenly woke up tomorrow. Okay, if I look at my chat right now, and Kirby woke up tomorrow and is the Israeli, pal is the Israeli prime minister. True to and true to Jen Awards is, um, uh, is the president of the Palestinians, both of them, like uh, Gaza and the West Bank and East Jerusalem, like, and we like, okay, we know how to solve this. We'll follow the Oslo Accord. You guys are both good people. We should be able to solve this, right? Like you want the end of the war. You want, you're good people. You probably would have a really hard time solving it. And the reason why is because there are so many other forces dragging you down. It's like a misery loves company thing, right? I talked about this a little bit before, but there is a story that you can read actually in Hillary Clinton's book, um, Hard Choices, when she was uh, when she was Secretary of State. I think it's the 2008 Gaza War. 
I think it's that, or is it 2012? I think it's 2008. And the Gaza war is nasty. Palestinians are dying at incredibly high rates. Israel's getting a huge bad rap. It's like a lose situation for, uh, for the United States. So Hillary Clinton goes, flies to Israel, uh, Israel-Palestine, to start trying to negotiate a ceasefire to save lives. So she's there doing her Secretary of State thing. She gets Israel to agree to some terms that Israel normally wouldn't agree to because she's an incredibly good negotiator. And she was known for this, right? Like, even if you hate Hillary Clinton, she was very good in her negotiation skills, like in diplomacy. And then she goes to Mahmoud Abbas and she goes to his hotel room. Mahmoud Abbas is the leader of the uh, Fatah of the Palestinians. She couldn't go and talk to Hamas because the United States has a policy of not negotiating with terrorists and Hamas is regarded as a terrorist organization, right? So she has to talk to the leader of Fatah, Mahmoud Abbas. He's still the leader of Fatah. And so she goes to Mahmoud Abbas's a part, a hotel and she goes into his hotel room and they're initially negotiating with both of their teams like he's got his team you know that's like whispering in his ear and she's got her team and they're like doing this hardcore negotiation and eventually she realizes that both their teams are making it worse so she kicks them all out and she says Mahmoud like maybe you and I should just be alone in here so Hillary Clinton is alone in a hotel room like literally like in the hotel room with Mahmoud Abbas and for 24, I think 26 hours straight, like she stayed up all night, he stayed up all night, they negotiated. They just, they, she had pens and paper and it's detailed, like, you agree to this, you agree to that, they'll agree to this, they've agreed to this, but if you do this, like, they won't agree to this. And it's this constant back and forth and negotiation, and she finally gets him to hammer down and agree, okay, and agree to something, and agree to a ceasefire, and then he says, these terms, if you can get Israel to agree to this, I would agree to it, but I can't do it. And she says, what do you mean you can't do it? And what do you mean you can't just agree? Like you just said that these are all the terms that you want. These are all the terms that like that Fatah would be happy with. And he says, well, I have um, my kids are in like a school. I think it was in Paris. I forget. I think it's Paris. Um, they're in like a specific Muslim school in Paris. And if I agree to this, Iran is going to be incredibly upset, okay, and there are some other foreign powers that would be upset, and they might kidnap his children, okay, or do something to them in retaliation for him agreeing to, a, a, to, a ce to this peace deal and ceasefire with Israel for the Gaza war. So she literally has to go and get, like, the, like, some special forces, I don't know the details, to go rescue his kids from their school in Paris to make sure that they're safe from people, from Muslim extremists that want to continue the Israeli-Palestinian conflict so he can agree to what is a good peace deal to save pal mostly Palestinian lives in Gaza. Just imagine, there are not a lot of leaders that have, would have negotiated, would have dedicated a lot of that shit, right? And that's just like an example of how many forces are constantly at play, right? That like, even if you agree, uh, you agree to get them to agree, sorry, even if you convince them to agree, there's so many forces, there's so many cruel actors in the world that want this conflict to continue. And it's one of those like sad, sad realities um, that makes a lot of people very pessimistic about the conflict in the region. But yeah, so that's just, it's just a little story and I'm sure there's tons of stories like that. ...meant to hammer out the final details on peace drag on for years. And a big Camp David summit in 2000 comes up empty. Palestinians come to believe peace isn't coming, rise up in a second inter- Oh, Fox, Fox left out so much here that really upsets me. This is so important. I, I look how they just skip over Camp David. It's just like, oh, well, Camp David doesn't work. There's a reason why it doesn't work. So, Ehud Barak is on the left, and Yes Arafat's on the right. This is where before Palestinians actually get their own elections. So, they're just being led by a, basically a dictator. There are so many different interpretations of what happened at the 2000 Camp David summit. To this day, we almost don't know fully of what happened. It's almost like you wish he had a camera. I trust out of all the records of what happened, I trust Bill Clinton's records the most. Now you can read his entire writing of the details of what happened at the summit. But I think his is the most likely to be true. It has like, it makes the most sense. Um, and I feel like he's almost like the least biased. He still is biased, but the least out of all these situations. Um, but the problem was, was that what happens 
in the early 2000s, right? Like the Second Intifada. Now the Second Intifada, now you can't just launch a Second Intifada. You don't just snap your fingers. It requires planning. Like this is not just like random insurrections like the ones that you saw recently in Israel and Palestine. This is like, it's like a basically an attempt at a revolution and it requires funding, it requires money, right? And you can't just like, and you have to get money in through illegal means, right? It's a lot of planning. So this was planned for years in advance. So it starts in the year 2000. So while Yasser Arafat is at Camp David negotiating a peace deal, he knows from the beginning, he knows that he is going to reject it no matter what. And this is what makes me angry about the 2000 Camp David summit, right? Like he, he has already gotten all the funding and planning and he's already under all the pressure from those foreign, like foreign powers as well to be doing the second intifada. And so he's doing all of this kind of shit. He's already planned it. So he knows he's going to reject it no matter what. Because if, what, if, if he just accepts it, what's he going to do? Just be like, oh, well, we spent all the money for no reason. We don't actually need those bombs, guys. We don't need the suicide bombs. We don't need any of that. Like, he's not going to just throw away the money. He's known locally as Arafat Stacks. Yep. He would often get money for, you know, Palestinian issues, right? Like Palestinian health, health care, things like that. And he just literally, the stereotype is he would send it to his, his wife in Paris. Go shopping in Paris. Ehud Barak is an interesting character. Now, Ehud Barak is a leftist. And he's actually regarded, he's looked back not in a very positive light by Israelis. So he's the leader of the Labour Party. And in the late 90s, a lot of Israelis were ready to move towards peace. It had been a long time since conflict. It had been a long time since a terrorist attack. And so Israelis in general, um, there is a huge movement towards like leftism and, and all that kind of stuff. Boomers are boomers who in Israel are very leftist at the time. Um, are starting to to vote in elections like crazy, right? Because um, they're entering like their late 30s and 40s. So they're starting to really vote in elections. And so Israel as a whole is on a trajectory of moving left. Israel had also just recently gotten out of years of right-wing rule by Netanyahu. And he was incredibly corrupt and he ends up leaving in like this huge scandal. Huge scandal, right? So Ehud Barak um, comes to control, right? In a way, it's like, Finally, you have the right person to be entering the Camp David summit. Like, finally, you have the right person to be entering these peace talks. It's not Netanyahu. It's not um, Golda Meir, who had some race is issues with being racist to Arabs. It's not Menachem Begin, who had a history of being a, a, an Israeli terrorist. You've got, like, Ehud Barak, who's leftist. He's just got elected for the purpose of making, like, Israelis, like, they have, they have the 1993 Oslo Accords. They are ready to make peace. They are ready to do it. It's a big moment, right? And everyone kind of was looking up that this was like the time, especially the millennium was hot here. You know, it's like, God, this really Palestinian conflict? That's so 90s, you know? But Yasser Arafat comes already, already planning on rejecting it. And this is like one of those like really sad things because he'd already planned it and all of that kind of stuff. So. He ends up, what ends up happening is Ehud Barak offers something that Israel never offered before and probably will never offer again. They, uh, they offer almost everything that Palestinians want. Because the, the whole demand is that Israelis need to feel secure. Palestinians want to have their rights to live in a free area, right? So Palestinians need to agree to be secure for Israel's security, right? To not do any violence and stuff. And Israel needs to agree to pull out. Like, this is like the nature of their negotiation. And it's very hard because it requires a lot of trust. Um, which is why, you know, Billy, Billy old Clinton is here. So, Ehud Barak offers, you can look at the details of what they offered. You can read um, Bill Clinton's um, recommendation. There's like a lot of, um, this is, this wiki, wiki article is great about the effects of it. Right? And about like, you know, the idea of like the, the different views of what happened during this. But what's considered historical consensus right now is that what happened was Yasser Arafat had already planned to launch the Second Intifada. He'd already paid for it. It was already done. Like, the effects were already there. So he ends up, like, Yasser Arafat rejects the deal. So Palestinians are offered land swaps, like, full pullouts. So end of the occupation, end of settlements, full land swaps 
um, for like like land like land swaps that were incredibly fair, right? That today Palestinians would accept. They and the biggest thing that they were offered that I don't think they'll ever get again is they were offered financial reparations. They were offered financial reparations for um, for refugees. So this is something that the Palestinians would probably accept now. It was a big offer, and a lot of Israelis were very mad at that offer because they felt like it was too lenient. Um, he even offered Jerusalem, the like half of Jerusalem, which, again, I don't think would ever happen now. It's one of those, like, sad things. And as a consequence of this, so Yasser Arafat rejects this deal, and he rejects it because the one thing that Palestinians got that they didn't, um, the one thing Palestinians were rejected was a full right of return. What um, Ehud Barak offered was a symbolic right of return that some Palestinians could come back to their home, especially some original ones, and to like symbolize it, but they practically couldn't all return because they're now like 7 million. So he offers that. And because Palestinians were not given, and like an overall, and all their descendants were given a right to return, um, Yasser Arafat rejects it. Now, this is, you have to understand that in the negotiation world, the Palestinians know, and the Palestinian leadership know, they're never going to get a right of return. So if you are demanding a full right of return of every Palestinian refugee and their, and their descendants, you are demanding a never-ending a, a never uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's never going to happen. It's like, it's the equivalent of trying to get um, negotiate indigenous rights for indigenous Canadians. You're like, oh, well, you're only going to make indigenous people happy if you literally kick out all white people from Canada and make them go to the United States. It's just never going to happen. It, it doesn't matter. Even if it's the right thing to do, it's never going to happen. So if you're demanding that, you're basically being like a fundamentalist wanting war to continue forever. Yes, Sir Arafat would normally not agree to other things, but he'd already agreed to this. He, he'd already planned this out. And he gets funded for the war to continue. That's how he keeps his job. So Yes, Sir Arafat rejects this. Um, and the deal is so lenient towards Palestinians that Israelis, and keep in mind, Israelis are already not living in an economic good situation, right? Um, because they're still, even though they're, they've made peace with Egypt and stuff, they still have just recovered from the Gulf War with uh, Iraq. Like, Israelis are... Like, so Israelis are not, it's very controversial. Like, they wanted peace, but they're like, I don't know if we're going to offer all of this shit. Like, land swaps, East Jerusalem, like, uh, reparations. Like, even America doesn't offer reparations for slavery in the United States. No one else does a reparation. Like, what the fuck? And so it's somewhat controversial. And in this humiliating way, Yasser Arafat walks away from the deal and it fails. And it's largely regarded, and this is not being me being biased. Right. Because trust me, there are other peace deals where and this is later on. This happens later in the 2000s where Israel starts playing the same part that the Palestinians were playing initially, which is not coming to the peace ta table. Right. Later, Israel starts doing the same thing. So I'm not saying that this is something that the Palestinians like did completely. But in this instance, this is this is a Palestinian failure of Palestinian leadership. Now, I don't blame the Palestinian people because they didn't even get a vote for Yasser Arafat, okay? He's literally like a dictator. Like, he's just their leader, right? He was just not, like, that. Yeah, they, they, don't, they don't really have a real representative, which is another big issue at the time. Though Palestinians do largely regard Yasser Arafat in a very positive way. To this day, he's regarded, like, as, like, a hero. Like, there's murals of him and all this shit, which is obnoxious, but whatever. I'm not mad, you're mad, okay? It largely fails. Um, because of, yeah, Palestinian side, right? Um, there's some controversy now, but it's not, like, I'm telling you, the, the people on the other side are people like Norman Finkelstein, who has been mostly discredited. I actually read that journal of Palestine studies. It's actually a great study. It's a great journal. Please re read this journal. It's great. It's a journal. It's a, like, but yeah, his research is pathetic. He's not a, like, yeah, his research is pathetic, and it's not... He's basically being kicked out of academia. Um, there are... If you want to read academics that are very, very critical of Israel, a good person to read is probably Elan Pape, um, rather than Norman Finkelstein. So what happens right after the peace summit um, fails? Camp David, total failure, right? The minute that happens, like right afterwards, guess what starts? Second Intifada. And the second intifada is so much worse than the first. 
It's so much worse because this time it's being full funded by Iran in Syria, mostly Iran. And this is something a lot of people forget about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is how much foreign interests are, are interplaying with it. As much as the United States is involved, as much as Britain is involved, so is, uh, so is Iran. Even China's connected. So the second intifada starts and there is a main new tactic that Palestinians are using which are suicide bombs. And suicide bombs, like, so what they do, um, the reason why suicide bombs are used, originally other tactics that had been used historically were like um, hostages. People love taking hostages and then they negotiate like, oh, if you release these amount of prisoners, we'll release the hostages or we'll kill the hostages. What do you think of people who view Hamas as a resistance force against Israel? Um, do they have any basis for your knowledge? And it's crazy talk. It's, to me, like, I understand that perspective. But if that were the case, then Hamas would be targeting Israeli soldiers. They would be targeting uh, Israeli government buildings. They would do, be doing targeted assassinations of government figures. That's not what they're doing, right? They target civilians. Um, and the reason why is because they're incentivized to continue the, contact, con the, the conflict because it's the only way that they continue to exist themselves and keep getting voted in. It's a very fucked up dynamic. They do not help Palestinians. Right. If they were like people always think the issue is violence. The issue is not violence. It's not as simple as that. OK, like I study I study military history. Everyone's everyone's violent. OK, like the issue is not violent. I mean, violence is bad. I don't want to say I'm not I don't want to be encouraging violence, but that's not the issue. It's the type of violence. It's the purpose of the violence. Right. Um, and so I think the best response to someone who's advocating for Hamas is saying my issue is not with the violence of Hamas. Right. It's how they're violent. It's the fact that they target civilians and they're not targeting government. They're not doing targeted assassinations. They're not targeting soldiers. They're not like those. Those things are much more rare. They just do. They launch rockets into the air that are indiscriminate and often land on Palestinians. I think a lot of lefties connect with them because they I think and I think they rightly believe that sometimes a violent insurrection makes sense when you are faced with very violent oppression. And a way a lot of our modern states were created was through that, right? I mean, the United States was created through a very violent revolution. France escaped a very oppressive, absolute monarchy through a violent revolution. Like a lot of these things were established through violence that we ourselves regard as like, you know, very valuable tenets of, you know, human culture now. So I think like a lot of lefties don't understand, like, why do you just suddenly say like violence is never OK? And I think that that's totally fair. It's just the it's the type of violence um, that is the bigger problem to me. We're not talking about blowing up like, a, you know, the Israeli version of the Pentagon or the Knesset or something like we're talking about walking into a pizza store that primarily has children in it. And making sure the pizza store is the you're going in at lunchtime when it has the most children because children will get the most news stories and blowing it up. So you kill the most amount of people. And this idea that they can't do other things is just not true. Like, it's not true because they used to do other things. I think that the overall goal is to move beyond violence because we finally, at this point, we can, um, uh, we annihilate the globe. I agree. I agree. Like at some point we need to move beyond the violence, right? And I totally agree with that. I'm not advocating for violence. I'm just saying that's not the biggest issue. It's a huge issue, but that's not my main problem. To me, there's always degrees. I would prefer more ethical violence, more targeted violence versus indiscriminate violence. It's like I would prefer a war with no chemical weapons than a war with chemical weapons. I would prefer a war without nuclear warfare rather than with. So violence as a whole are bad, but there are grays that make that violence a little bit less shitty. And I think that grayness is important. And if you don't believe that grayness is important, then you've never been a victim of war. Because <laughs> trust me, if someone told you, would you rather be taken as a POW and get to sit in a cell all day? Or would you rather be taken as a POW and get waterboarded? You're probably going to pick the cell, okay? You're probably going to pick the cell. So the nature of the types of violence, even though you're being taken by force in both, you're not going to want to be waterboarded. There are grays to this violence that I think are very important. Father, this one much more violent than the first. The I'm glad that they mentioned that. Thank you, Vox. I'm actually somewhat impressed by this. There's still some things that they've left out, but there aren't really any outright mistruths. And 
they're largely being somewhat fair. Like there's some things they've left out that I think are a little shitty, but they were probably trying to make a shorter video. And I think that's so I'm being kind of impressed. Time it wound down a few years later, about a thousand Israelis and 3,200 Palestinians had died. But the second intifada really changes the conflict. Israelis become much more skeptical that Palestinians will ever accept peace or that it's even worth trying. Israeli Keep in mind, Israelis went into the year 2000 very, very ready to make peace, very leftist. And they come out of the second intifada in 2003, a few years later. I think it ends in 2000 years or 2005. Sorry, my mind's like, they come out of it hardened, angry. Almost every single person that I know, almost every single Israeli I know has lost someone in the second intifada. So just imagine what that does to your mindset. Because human beings are emotional. People stop having suffering. And wait, I talked about this with Anna. Suffering makes you selfish. So Israelis suffered during the Second Intifada. With that suffering, they become less empathetic to the Palestinian plight. They start saying, well, you're just trying to kill us and our children. Why do we give a shit about you anymore? We won. You're just, and you're still just trying to kill us. And that starts becoming an attitude of like, we try to make peace. You rejected our peace deal and then you kill her. And then you try to wipe us out. Like, and kill our civilians. And now you're making us live in fear. No, it's war now. It's war. And that starts becoming a very prevalent attitude. And to this day, this is probably the most common Israeli attitude. Very, very, and I'm, I'll be honest, very little empathy for Palestinians. So Israelis start becoming much more right-wing as a consequence. Those boomers I talked about that were kind of all lefty, hippie, like, let's make peace deals. They've all lost someone. They're hardened. And the thing is, Palestinians have been hardened for a really long time because they've been losing more people. So now they're hardened too. And so now you've got two hardened people. I use the term hardened because I don't even know what else to use. Like Israel does one more, one more big move for peace where they pull out of Gaza with um, Ariel Sharon. Immediately Hamas takes over. They start launching rockets. And that's kind of like the final nail in the coffin to a lot of Israelis. And that's really when the left, I don't want to say dies in Israel, but becomes very... Um, minimal. And the Overton window really ships to the right. So now you've got two hardened people and it's made things, obviously, this is when the conflict really ramps up and really becomes so much worse, particularly for Palestinians. Because now Israelis are much more right-wing. They're voting in much more right-wing governments. Even their left-wing governments are becoming more center, more moving more to the right. And as a whole, my opinion, it's funny because there's people in the chat right now I think that I'm a huge Israel defender, but I am telling you in Israel, I am considered very anti-Israel. Like they would consider me basically like a traitor. That's how far the overturn window shifted there by comparison. So my dad will always tell me, like whenever we're in Jewish circles or Israeli circles, he'll always say, don't bring up your politics, okay? He's like embarrassed. Jews as a whole stop voting so left both in Jews like in the diaspora in the United States, in Canada, in the UK, they start vote, stop voting so left. They now start voting much more right wing because the right wing governments are usually more supportive of Israel. And so like, this is why I really think the number one thing that you need when you want to enter and start learning about this conflict, and it sounds so corny. I mean, obviously, I think you should be armed with knowledge. You should learn about history. But all those things serve one purpose. And I think that that purpose is empathy. So the key to understanding this conflict is empathy, is really understanding the suffering that the people involved in this conflict have experienced. Because if you understand that suffering, and this is why I support Palestinian film and Israeli film and Palestinian art um, and storytelling and that cultural exchange, because telling one another stories, I remember telling my dad a story that I had heard from a, a Jordan veteran right, about something that he witnessed in a Palestinian village. If there's someone who can understand that kind of oppression, it's often a Jewish person. And I wish sometimes that Jews and Israelis understood what the Palestinians really went through, because I think they're so focused on this idea that they just hate them because they're Jews. And they don't think about where that hate is built from over time. And it doesn't excuse it, but it explains it. And I just like, I wish they would understand that. And I also wish that Palestinians would know when stop seeing Jews as just some like white colonizers because they're not. And look at them with some empathy. But again, when people are suffering, they have a hard time being empathetic. And 
this is why it's so important to look at this modern history of Israel and seeing how Israel became so right wing and so hardened, right? Because I think it makes sense, but it still sucks because it just leads to continuous more suffering. And so what starts happening after the effects of the Gaza pullout and the second intifada is Israelis become so right wing that they stop um, trying to make peace at all. And they start trying to do what's called a peace by strength strategy, which means basically not peace, but just really building Israel up to be strong, making Israel nuclear. Israel is nuclear, making Israel an economic powerhouse, right? Establishing, starting to really fund uh, Israeli technology. It starts being very focused on becoming Israel strong. And like, there's definitely this like fetishization within Israel of like strength. I mean, from a girl's perspective, it's really nice because the guys get really buff there, right? And they get like tan and buff. <laughs> but um, it's not fun other, uh, like, other than that. And you can so easily look at Israel as just pure evil. But if you understand that history, you're un you understand why they got there, right? And you have to do the same thing with Palestinians. And I just wish, and this does not mean that both sides are equal, right? Because I think right now they're definitely not. Um, it doesn't mean that there is like a equal power dynamic or anything, but it does mean that when you go, you do need to have empathy for what both are, have gone through um, to understand the depth of the conflict. But anyways, gonna let's finish the video. Politics shift right. The country builds walls and checkpoints to control Palestinians' movements. They're not really trying to solve the conflict anymore; just manage it. A pal yep, that's a great way to put it, Vox. Like. They're trying to manage it now. It's not about solving. It's about, you know, managing it through strength. Palestinians are left feeling like negotiating didn't work and violence didn't work, and that they're stuck under an ever-growing occupation with no future as a people. That year, Israel withdraws from Gaza. Hamas gains power, but splits from the Palestinian Authority in a short civil war, dividing Gaza from the West Bank. This Israel is the puts last Gaza that under I a suffocating about. blockade. There were still a lot of leftists still left, after the, the second intifada, but all those ones, like, they, like, and no more And unemployment rises to 40%. This is the state of the conflict as we know it today. It's relatively new, and it's unbearable for Palestinians. In the West Bank, more sure. and more settlements are smothering Palestinians, often respond with protests and sometimes with violence. The most just want normal lives. Sam, In Gaza, so much Hamas, for and that, other so. violent groups have periodic wars with Israel. The fighting overwhelmingly kills Palestinians, including lots of civilians. In Israel itself, most people have become apathetic. For the most part, the occupation keeps the conflict relatively removed from their daily lives, with moments of brief but horrible violence. There's little political will for peace. The wall that was put up stopped most of the terrorist attacks. So now the prime fear for Israelis in terms of violence um, are random like stabbing attacks, which still happen sometimes. Um, which is obviously really scary, but it's not as scary as the suicide bombs that had happened before the wall was put up, and rockets. Um, and rockets are mostly, they originally were only an issue for the neighboring cities to Gaza, but recently rockets were actually reaching Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. So rockets are now an issue for most, for a, lo a larger portion of Israel, but luckily they have the Iron Dome to kill, I think, 90% of those rockets. Otherwise, much more Israelis would be dying. No one really knows where the conflict goes from here. Maybe a third intifada, maybe the Palestinian Authority collapses. But everyone agrees that things as they are now can't last much longer. Israel's occupation of the Palestinians is too unstable to last, and that unless something dramatic changes, whatever comes next will be much worse. Yeah, I think that was actually really well done by Vox. There were some problems, there were some inaccuracies, but honestly, like, way better than I expected. So I'm kind of impressed. But yeah, that is largely the history of that conflict, right? There's, we can get into much more of the details. Like I, just to be clear, I know I am not an expert at all on any of this shit. Like my research is literally on one battle in one year, in one war, from one perspective, which is Jordan. So I just know a lot about the conflict because it's so adjacent to my research. But I please fact check me on everything. Some great resources to read um, is Benny Morris. You can read Righteous Victims or 19, the year 1948. Really great reads. Ignore his political opinions, please. Um, he's one of those people that got hardened by 2001. But there's uh, if you want to read uh, someone that's very critical of Israel, Elon Pape is a better read. Though I've got some issues with some of his history, but...
You know, he's definitely one of the better critics. Do not, and I repeat, do not read American political books about Israel written by lawyers, okay? Do not read Alan Dershowitz in defense of Israel. I repeat, okay? Do not read shit written by like political scientists, lawyers, especially American, <laughs> because they all have a, they're all trying to push you a narrative. And in that book, basically Anne Dershowitz is just a lawyer and he got OJ off. So like, don't read that shit. Please read actual historians. Um, the Journal of Palestine is great for reading updates on a regular basis from historians. But just remember that historians will often disagree, but that's not what historical consensus is. So you might read a historian that's going to tell you like something like that it was due, com that Palestinians left completely due to the radio announcements, right? And there are a lot of historians that believe that. So you'll read those and you'll be like, oh, well, this is an authority. You want to go with historical consensus. This is why I recommend Benny Morris, because Benny Morris is considered like, he's not very controversial. He's not considered like, his history is not very controversial. It's um, accepted by even pro-Palestinian historians. It's accepted by pro-Israeli historians. His history, and he's so meticulous, like I'm telling you, this guy is treated like a fucking hero in the history world, even in people who don't do Israeli-Palestinian history, because he's just so meticulous with his numbers. So it can be sometimes a bit of a dry read. But if you want really to get like fact, not fiction, historical consensus, middle of the road, like not no, like as least as a little bias as possible, Benny Morris is the way to go. Just ignores politics. Um, Benny Morris has now become much more right wing. I think he lost someone in the second intifada, but he originally was very left wing. So when he wrote those original books, he's actually originally very critical of Israel. So sometimes he'll have forewords um, that he kind of writes now. If you read like a recent article, and there will be some corrections here and there. But largely his politics do, are, are regarded as not affecting his history. My advisor, when I was doing my graduate degree, is, is to, the, to this day, a huge critic of Israel. Um, he's an Ottoman Empire historian, so he's not a huge Israel fan. He would much prefer that Ottoman Empire uh, keeps control of Israel. Um, he's a huge critic of Israel, and he was the one that taught me to respect Benny Morris. So I always thought that that professor likes Benny Morris. It's a good, like, this guy's legit as fuck. Just everyone has their shit, and his politics are a little extreme. By the way, if you like my historical content, um, the best way to support me is on Patreon. Um, and honestly, even if you just like donate like a few dollars a month, like that helps me immensely because it really adds up. And it's a really great, great way to communicate with me that you appreciate the more academic content.